for today's uh, first seminar, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Petra Rieschak. Petra did her undergraduate degree at the University of Zagreb, um, and she, while she was there, did a couple of internships in Dresden and Munich um, before moving to the University of Munich for her PhD in the lab of Felix Muller Planets, where she has been studying remodeling of higher order chromatin structures. Um, she is very close near the, the end of her PhD, and so I think she's looking for postdocs, so keep your eyes out for her application um, if you are so lucky. Uh, but today I'm very excited to hear Petra tell us about her work on nucleosome sliding in a condensed chromatin. So please join, join me in giving a warm welcome to today's first speaker, Petra. So, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Ben, for a very kind introduction. My name is Petra Vidjak and I'm finishing my PhD in Felix Miller Planets Group. And I would like to thank to the organizers for putting this great seminar series together and to giving me the opportunity to tell you about my work titled Nucleosome Sliding in Condensed Chromatin. Almost all eukaryotes wrap their long genomic DNA around the histone core, thereby forming a nucleosome. This gives rise to the 10 nanometer fiber unfolded chromatin array that can further reversibly fold into higher order structures. It can also undergo phase separation and form chromatin condensates as recently suggested by the microosons group. Now the folded chromatin will pose many challenges on the enzymes that have to work on it. Not all nucleosomes will be accessible and some will be buried in the folded structure. Even if the enzyme manages to reach the nucleosome, its binding site might be occupied by the interaction with other nucleosome. We address this fundamental question on the example of chromatin remodeler Iceland. Chromatin remodelers are enzymes that use ATP energy to slide nucleosomes along the DNA, thereby setting the nucleosome position. Nucleosome positioning is very important for transcription regulation and genome stability. So we asked how and if can remodelers work in a folded chromatin. I've prepared a model substrate for purified long DNA and purified octamers. This nucleosome array contains 25 copies of strong nucleosome positioning sequence interspaced with the 50 base pair of linker DNA. This is how it looks like under negative stain electron microscopy. With addition of magnesium, the previously extended unfolded array compacts into folded chromatin structure. Now the single arrays in both of these conditions are pretty heterogeneous. So we have quantified the array circularity and indeed upon folding, you see that the array circularity gets much closer to one, which is consistent with formation of the much more complex structure. So higher magnesium concentration supported intramolecular folding of nucleosome array and did not lead to substantial multimerization that we have observed by analytical ultracentrifugation that I don't have time to show you. Our nucleosomes occlude restriction enzyme sites. Particularly, we will make use of BAMH1 site. When the remodeler slides this nucleosome away, the BAMH1 site will become accessible for restriction, cleave, restriction enzyme cleavage and the cleavage products we can analyze on the gel. We can quantify cut and uncut DNA and compare coefficient for nucleosome sliding in unfolded and folded nucleosome array. You can see that the nucleosome sliding happens in both arrays, folded and unfolded, and that is only threefold times slower than in folded than in unfolded array. So it seems that intermolecular folding is not a big barrier for nucleosome sliding. But under very high nucleosome concentration, addition of magnesium chloride will cause phase separation and formation of chromatin condensates. These condensates form through intermolecular interactions of individual nucleosome array molecules. And we have constructed a phase diagram by quantifying the percent of surface of a microscope slide covered by chromatin condensates. And you can appreciate from here that only under high array concentrations, chromatin condensates appear. Phase separation will pose additional challenges for enzymes. 
first, the factors like enzymes and their cofactors might be excluded from those condensates. And even if they manage to enter, they will face pretty high nucleosome concentration. We expect that the nucleosome concentration will be so high that all, all of the enzyme will be bound at the entire time. Therefore, it will be almost impossible for enzyme to diffuse through the condensate, unless, of course, there are some special mechanisms in place to help it unbind. And nucleus is busy environment, and there is molecular crowding that can as well change the properties of the enzyme and the, and the properties of a reaction that catalyzes. So can we modelers work in chromatin condensates? We have mixed site labeled chromatin with ISLI GFP labeled and induced phase separation. And not only that ISLI could enter chromatin condensates, it was also strongly enriched. More surprisingly, we have preformed chromatin condensates and that added ISLI GFP. And even then, ISLI was enriched almost to the same, basically to the same level in chromatin condensates. The control experiments have shown that the isolate GFP does not form phase separation, that does not phase separate on its own, and that the GFP on its own does not get enriched in chromatin condensates. So isolate penetrates even preform chromatin condensates. But does nucleosome sliding indeed happen inside those condensates? To answer this question, we have developed an imaging-based nucleosome sliding assay. We have worked on, we have based our work on the assay previously published by Gita Narlikar group, where we made use of the nucleosomes that have a donor dye at the DNA end, which is very close to the acceptor dye placed to the octamer through H2A fusion. Now in this end position configuration, those two dyes are very close and the threat is high. Now, we, if we add ATP and ISLI, the nucleosome slides away, increasing the distance between the dyes, and the threat is low. We have mixed those nucleosomes with our chromatin condensates. They got enriched pretty well in the condensates. We have made use of fluorescence lifetime imaging to image donor lifetime of the labeled nucleosomes, both in the condensates and outside in the solution. Just briefly, donor lifetime is low when the threat is high, and donor lifetime is high if the threat is low. This is how it looks under the microscope. You can appreciate that we see individual condensates infiltrated with labeled mononucleosomes. The donor lifetime is low, as you see from the blue color, because all of the nucleosomes are in this end position configuration. Now we have prepared two samples that both contain chromatin condensates premixed with chromatin remodeler ISLI. And in one, we will flow in ATP, and in another one, we will flow in non-hydrolyzable analog AMP PMP. And let's see a movie of what happens. At time zero, we add nucleotides. And you can see that already after a minute or two, the donor lifetime increases significantly in ATP uh, sample, which is consistent with nucleosome sliding in chromatin condensate, whereas there is no change with AMP-PMP non-hydrolyzable analog. We can compare sliding in solution and condensate, and we see that the nucleosome sliding in condensate is just modestly slower than that in a solution. So ISLA slides nucleosomes inside chromatin condensates. This was a surprising result for us. And we employed holotomography, a type of label-free imaging, to see what is really the nucleosome concentration in chromatin condensates. Holotomography uh, gives out a refractive index. So we have measured the refractive index of the chromatin condensates and the solution around it. Refractive index is a linearly proportional to nucleosome concentration. And from here, I have calculated that nucleosome concentration in chromatin condensates is around 230 micromolar. This is like in a nucleus. So this would say that our in vitro chromatin condensates are pretty good model 
to study challenges that enzymes face in a crowded nucleus. But still, as I told you before, under such a high concentration, the enzyme should be practically immobile. And we have tested this by doing isolated GFP FRAP, in which we have bleached a small central part of the remodeler fluorescence and followed the recovery and follow the recovery through time. And indeed, without a nucleotide or with ADP added, or with added these two non hydrolyzable analogs, AMP, PMP, and beryllium fluoride, the enzyme was very immobile, pretty much stuck. But the drastic increase in dynamics happened when we added ATP. So, isolate hydrolysis, sorry, the ATP hydrolysis is required for isolate dynamic on chromatin. Now, we hypothesized that the nu active nucleus on sliding might change mechanical properties of the chromatin condensate and, to ma and making this uh, diffusion possible. To assess mechanical properties, we have employed optical tweezers to fuse condensates in a controlled manner, as you can see in this movie, and to measure the velocity of that fusion. Here you can see measured fusion velocities. Blue dots are individual measurements and the black bar is the average of all measurements. Everything was normalized to the fusion of chromatin only condensates. That's why uh, this value is one. Addition of isolate did not change the fusion velocity. However, addition of AMP, PMP, or ADP beryllium fluoride, two non hydrolyzable analogs, or ADP, either cause no fusion at all or very slow fusion. Surprisingly, addition of ATP restored the fusion velocity back to the normal levels. We have used ATP as that isolate. It's a mutant that can bind ATP, but it cannot hydrolyze it. So basically, it's stuck in ATP bound conformation. The mutant on its own decreased slightly uh, fu uh, fusion velocity of condensates, but really drastic change happened when we added ATP and, uh, and the velocity was really low, very similar to what we observe with the isolate and non-hydrolyzable analogs. So when bound to any nucleotide, isolate hardens condensates. And ATP hydrolysis prevents it from doing so. Now we have two key experimental observations. First, ATP hydrolysis is required for isolate dynamics. And second, the ATP hydrolysis prevents nucleotide-induced condensate hardening. We come up with a model where isolate uses two of its binding domains that can bind nucleosome to bind two nucleosomes at the same time. And the strength of the interaction will depend on the nucleotide state. In ATP bound state, which is uh, mimicked in experiments with non hydrolyzable analogs, both of the interactions are very strong. Then the ATP hydrolyzes, and one of the bonds weakens. It weakens so much that it can dissociate. ADP is released, and the interaction, interaction strength of these two interactions switches. And now this domain can again form strong interaction, making it possible for it to rebind to another nucleosome. However, this domain interaction is now weakened and it can rebind upon the uh, upon binding of the another ATP molecule. This is how we imagine a remodeler to translocate on the nucleosomes in chromatin condensates without uh, without basically unbinding. It's bound all the time, but it walks through nucleosomes as a kit would uh, walk on a monkey bar. That's why we call our model a monkey bar model. So from our model, we derived a few very simple assumptions and performed molecular dynamic simulations of ice FRAP. And indeed, only in the case of active ATP hydrolysis, Actually, the, when compared with all other conditions, the active ATP hydrolysis was caused the fastest remodeler FRAP. 
we have also simulated condensate fusion. And this fusion was the slowest when the enzyme was in AMPPMP bound state. So our monkey bar model qualitatively explains experimental data, but we are aware that the situation is probably much more complex than that. So I've showed you today that isolate slides nucleosome in folded and condensed chromatin. And we propose that energy of ATP hydrolysis is not only used to slide nucleosomes, but also to break non-productive nucleosome interactions and to actively diffuse through dense nucleosomes. We think that these properties can be shared as well with other ATPases. Finally, our monkey bar model predicts that if the ATPase compromise remodelers are present in cell nucleus, are present in the cell nucleus, and they will of course bind ATP and they cannot hydrolyze it. So they will cross-link to nucleosomes in, in that manner. This will change mechanical properties of chromatin in the no dominantly negative way. And we are excited to see what is the role of this in chromatin dynamics and pathologies. So this brings me to most important slide. So I would like to thank uh, Felix and the all current members of the group for their uh, discussion and help with this uh, talk. Uh, all previous uh, alumni uh, of our group that contributed to experimental part. Special thanks goes to Johannes and Dita who performed optical tweezers and modeling. Flint fret measurements were done by Mariano in our amazing core facility bioimaging. FRAP was done by Alessandro Scacchetti uh, when he was still a student with Peter Becker. EM measurements were collected by uh, Joe from Mario Halic's group. He also moved on to another group. Analytical centrifugation that I did not have time to show you was uh, done in core biophysics facility by Michaela. And holotomography was uh, uh, performed by company Nanolife uh, by Marlies. Uh, so this work was done in Biomedical Center Munich. Uh, in meantime, our group uh, moved to Technical University Dresden, which is also a pretty great place to work. And Felix is, uh, has few positions open. So if you are interested, if you like what we are doing, send him an email. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. It was a beautiful talk and beautiful data. Um, we've already got a couple of questions in. Just a reminder to people, you can type these into the Q&A or you can click the raise hand button and I'll unmute you to ask your question yourself. Uh, we'll start off with a question from Benjamin Weekly, who asked, do you know which amino acid residues on histones are required for ISY remodeling and sliding? And have you tried mutating the histone residues to test this? Um, so it is... Um... A lot is known about ISY. Many domains are important, uh, both for the uh, sliding process and uh, uh, also for regulation. But uh, we have not uh, touched that part yet. But of course, it will be very interesting to see. Natalia has a, her hand up, and I'm uh, allowing her to unmute and ask her question. Hi, Petra. Great talk. So I was just wondering because um, histone H4 acetylation was shown to have inhibitory effect on ice switch. Maybe it would be an easy experiment then to do all the mutation analysis, you know, just to acetylate the histones and see if you get uh, the inhibition. Uh, hi, Natalia. Uh, so it's an interesting suggestion. Um, we, we are very interested to see how actually uh, not only nucleosome modifications, but also other binders would, uh, would challenge our model. Uh, so hopefully we will test acetylation, but so far we haven't done it. Okay, thanks. Do about, so for the, the, nucle the condensate hardening that you see uh, with ISY and like ADP or other analogs, have you looked into, have you tried testing like the, what concentration of ISY is needed for this? And if there's like some ratio of ISY to nucleosomes that would uh, need to be reached? Uh, 
So yes and no. So basically this has to, the experiment has to be done in the really low ice wave concentration. So ice wave has to be substoichiometric to nucleosomes, like it would be in the nucleus. So this uh, particular example is one ice wave on 10 nucleosomes. Otherwise, if you, you can titrate ice wave and at some point the fusion would, uh, would really stop because ice wave would crosslink uh, the chromatin, as you can see also in the model. Question, which is uh, says, nice talk, Petra. Can you explain more about the phase separation and how is ice wave one helping uh, helps in phase separation in vivo? Um, so in vivo, I, I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, but uh, how we think uh, this works for us is um, actually it can be in two uh, in two manners. So basically, um, since I have this open, let me start with that. So ice fly, since it has two binding domains, it can just physically crosslink uh, two nucleosome arrays and thereby like pulling them together and enhancing the phase separation, or it can just bind one nucleosome. And then um, as suggested by Gita Narlikar's group for HP1, for example, uh, it can make nucleosome more prone to phase separation. But this is of course just speculation. We have not tested that. We've got time for one more question. So I've, uh, uh, Michalia has her hand um, raised. So I've asked her to unmute um, and ask her question. Um, hi, Peter. Very nice talk. I was wondering, so Carl Wu's lab um, published um, a little while ago uh, a paper on all sorts of different remodelers and their on and off times. Um, and I was wondering, how does that data fit in with your own? Uh, hi, Michaela. Thank you for mentioning that. It actually fits uh, pretty nicely. Uh, so they have also published uh, as uh, we are proposing that you need uh, active ATP hydrolysis uh, to make a uh, remodeler move through the nucleosomes. Uh, but in addition, we have also shown, which you can do only in vitro, that the, uh, this property is a property conserved in ATPase, that you don't require any additional subunits to, to make this happen. Thank you. We'll conclude our talk. We or the Q and A for questions. We'll move on to the next uh, the next seminar. Uh, you can still type questions in the Q and A. And Petra, if you wouldn't mind just typing, you can type your answers there uh, for the questions yeah. that are still unanswered. But thank yeah. you again for the brilliant talk, uh, and I'll pass it over to Christine now. Thank you.